Many Nigerians are still tweeting this fund, the suspension of the microblogging site by the federal government. People have found a way around the government's action by using virtual private networks or VPNs, which allow them to bypass local networks. But that doesn't mean the country isn't bleeding. NetBlocks, which tracks internet governance, estimates that Nigeria could be losing 2 billion naira every day. Twitter remains shot. Now, a senior lecturer of law and technology at the School of Law in Swansea University, Inenna Ifanya Jufo, is joining us to analyze the suspension. Good morning, Dr. Inenna. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. This yes, this, this conversation regarding a Twitter ban is a very big one. You know, lots of angles, lots of sides to the story. Uh, the legal angle and the VPN issue, the OTTPS, and, you know, just all of this, the firewalls. But let's begin with, you know, the ban on Twitter, the suspension on Twitter. Many Nigerians are saying this is illegal. This is an infringement on our rights. You know, and the governments from their stance are saying we're doing this to protect, you know, sanity and, you know, peace in the country. What, what do you think it is? Absolutely agree with the majority, like you said, um, because the usage of social media in the digital era is actually tied to the right to freedom of information. And, you know, based on international human rights instruments, you know, everyone has a right to freedom of expression. And, of course, this includes the right um, to seek, receive, and impart information of all kinds, you know, through any media, any media at all would include the internet by virtue of the position of the United Nations now. So based on that, blanket internet shutdowns, this sort of generic blockings and filtering of services are considered even by the UN to be a violation of international human rights law. So people have a right in the digital age to share information, to receive information. And you also have to realize that this discussion is not just tied to freedom of information, but also other rights that are derived from the expression of that right through the use of social media platforms. So when you begin to look at things like this, you begin to consider the side of the government as well in terms of trying to protect security or ensure a secure and peaceful internet space. That is possible. But however, it is always based on necessity and proportionality considering the overwhelming public interest. And tracing what led to this, the deletion of the tweet of the president, it makes it all very amusing, to say the least. And you want to think that the state would actually consider the general interest of the public as against something which may seem quite trivial. So absolutely very diverse um, um, conversations going on, but absolutely at the core of it is a stifling of people's fundamental right to information. All right. L let's look at the legal uh, part of it now. Um, there is uh, threats by Serap and a few others to sue the government for infringing on Nigerians' rights by, you know, the Twitter suspension. Um, so, you know, what, what um, would that play out like in court, uh, um, um, the way it stands? And at the same time, there's also, you know, news reports saying that the um, AGF, um, um, Malami, uh, w was saying that Nigerians will be arrested for yeah. using Twitter after it has been suspended. Um, so quickly also share your thoughts on that one. Is there any laws that are being broken? Uh, if Nigerians continue to find ways to bypass this suspension and still use Twitter? Now, I'm talking about civil society organizations. From time immemorial, civil society organizations have always instituted actions against government um, for infringement of human rights. They have an obligation as well to ensure the respect and promotion of human rights. Now, human rights here, the difference here is just digital rights. So human rights exist online as they do offline and they should be respected in full. So yes, they do have that obligation as well. And there is no distinction being given to it in terms of just because this is being expressed on Twitter. Rights exist online as they do offline and they should be respected. In fact, digital technologies provide a means to advocate, defend and exercise human rights. And so civil society organizations can actually seek to enforce um, the promotion of human rights. Now, in terms of the prosecution issue, People are prosecuted when they violate laws. And as I stand here, I do not know any particular law in Nigeria that prohibits or precludes the use of social media. 
Now, you can prosecute illegal activities on social media. That is stipulated. But then, are we now criminalizing use of social media? Is there now a blanket criminalization of social media? Because if that is the case, then that means the usage of every social media platform will then be a basis for prosecuting. I mean, we can draft laws in the most draconian terms. The issue is, can we enforce those laws? So there is no particular law banning use of Twitter, except if there will be a move to then say it. You know, so saying that a ban is a ban, going against it is illegal. Crimes or issues that have to be prosecuted and have to be clearly stipulated in a book of law or somewhere, to be clear. So, so, so are we then criminalizing? Is that what we are saying? Okay, so, well, as it stands, you know, saying there's no law. So as it stands, there's, there's no legal backing for the president's action. It just is a pronouncement. States can do whatever they want. They can say whatever they want. You know, like I said, the question is in terms of enforcement. Can you, right. because, yes, it's in terms of implementation. You know, they, right now it is not a law. You've made a pronouncement, you've banned it. What we will see then is the move to then back. Most times you make a policy or a strategy before you give it out to the public. In this case, you've said something. There is no policy in place. There is no law yet stipulated in place. You just give a blanket order to so, you know, restrict. So in terms of enforcement now, many Nigerians are, are unable to access Twitter. I, for one, have not been able to access Twitter for the past few days. So let's talk about how you know, Nigerians are finding smart ways, like using VPNs, to bypass that and what, what the likely impacts could be. Well, use of VPNs are not generally um, illegal. It depends on the jurisdiction. And I must well, say that... Just a minute. Could you, could you help us break down? What is a VPN for those who do not understand? So we're all on the same so page. So VPNs are virtual private networks. Now, what virtual private networks do is that they generally allow users to change their IP addresses. So it's kind of a tool that not only provides free and safe surfing on the internet, but it also opens doors to restricted and blocked internet. Okay. which you can't access in some countries. So when you change your IP address, for example, you raise information about your location. So you could be in Nigeria, but virtually you are in Tanzania. So then content you would normally not have permission to have, you, you know, to, you would. So some countries, many countries actually restrict use of VPNs and mostly because they want to engage in internet censorship and control methods. So in those countries, if you use them now, I'm not very happy saying this because, you know, I'm not on the side of the government here. But if you use VPN in those countries, then it's illegal. But then more, many big corporations use VPN. It allows for anonymity and anonymity on the Internet is a right. It's legal. All right. Well, there's also no laws against VPN in Nigeria yet. Yes. Um, yes. Well, but, yeah. but, but then the fact is VPNs can also be a basis or allow people to use um, Internet for illegal activities. So you're better off having people use Twitter openly than yeah. having them, you know, go through VPNs. All right. Now, now let's talk, uh, talk about, you know, something that came up in the news over the weekend, and that is the uh, partnership with China to build, you know, some Internet firewall. Um, and uh, create Nigeria's own internet uh, server, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. How does that work? And, you know, is that something that, you know, we should be excited about, maybe? No, absolutely not. There is a concept now, increasingly, cyber balkanization, or what you call the split internet. And you find that states are now, because actually, you know, the use of social media, internet is not tied to any geographical territory or, you know, location. So, Cyberspace is not generally controlled by one country, but states are now trying to control and regulate. So it's becoming a dangerous reality. Of course, you've called China, I would normally not want to call any country where you have what we call the firewall of China. So other countries are trying, it actually leads to digital authoritarianism. It's not a good thing where states want to engage in what you call information sovereignty. The effect of that is to kind of enforce tyranny in on the internet inside. So we shouldn't really be excited about things um, like this, because then it will curtail use of internet. It will curtail the use of, you know, internet for freedom of information as well. It's really not a good um, development. What the powers? Yeah, has sorry. To be yeah. open I'm, I'm trying to find out what powers uh, that gives uh, the Chinese government, for example, or the North Korean government. If you have your own uh, firewall or your own internet um, uh, server, 
Um, what powers does it give you? Does it give you abil the ability to shut down an app or the, uh, the use of an app in your, in your country? So it, it depends. It could be full control, it could be partial, or it could be free. For many states, it's usually free. So it depends on what you're controlling at, one time, at a particular time. There have been moves, for example, Russia a few years back asking Facebook to domicile all data. And this is a, a, you know, a firm that is not there. So it depends on what is actually being controlled. You know, some regions as well do not allow some of the apps to even be used. So it actually depends on what is being sought to. I, I can't speak to yeah. say this is what China is doing or this is what they don't have to do, but it depends on what is actually being controlled. So different states can say, you know, we don't want the use of Facebook. There are places you can use WhatsApp, for example. Yes. So, okay, yes, so I, I want us to talk about how this is affecting Nigerian businesses, you know, the e-commerce space, because a story from The Guardian we read this morning said, $12 billion e-commerce suffers as Twitter ban cost 7.5 billion naira in three days. Also, um, the PDB here said that, you know, Nigeria has lost 4.4 billion naira in two days. So can you help us break down the statistics to what this might mean for, you know, the, the vendor on Twitter who's using Twitter to market her goods and services? So how really is this affecting us as a people? Good. Absolutely. Now, you know, most times we forget that civil and political rights are also tied to socioeconomic rights. So you find that the ripple effect of information or using social media can also mean socioeconomic development. It can also mean access to economic benefits. It can also mean access to social benefits. So in terms of this, you know, most times when you talk about social media in the Nigerian space, all that comes to the fore is that youths, you know, are, are, are using social media as a basis for misbehavior. We bring in cultural dimensions. Young people can't speak to adults in a particular way. People advertise their businesses on Twitter. You know, Twitter has become a basis for not just exchange of research, exchange of business idea. People seek out employment on social media, buying and selling. And this is an age of digital trade. This is an age where states should be engaged in discussions of digital transformation. And, you know, the African Union just released um, a, a, a digital transformation strategy. And this is what states should be queuing to rather than looking for ways to stifle social media use. Now there is a move asking young people to develop digital apps that they will be supported. We never had those thoughts until Twitter deleted a post. You know, it is just the way this whole thing comes. So the impact economically is not just to individuals, but even to states, because the ripple effect is that if citizens enjoy economic benefits, it also benefits the state in terms of societal development. So, so yes. Yes, so still really, you know, talking about this economic, um, you know, the implications for the country. We're not experts right now are warning that this would definitely not attract investors into the country and that as a, uh, you know, economically will, will, will suffer. Um, what do you, th you know, think about this? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm sure you know about the African free trade zone. We are yeah. looking for ways to encourage trade, commercialization, e-commerce, you know, digital trade. With things like this, remember, if you block Twitter in Nigeria, what of those who rely on Twitter as well to seek, impart, and receive information from Nigeria? So you're not just curtailing people in your jurisdiction, but also people outside of the territory. And if a state, a democratic state, is seen as being authoritarian, it could scare away investors. Imagine using the internet as a basis for developing your investment, and then the government can arbitrarily just close it down. I wouldn't want to invest in such a jurisdiction. So we really have to be careful about how we make our policies. We may have ideologies or reasons or notions as to why we take, um, uh, we engage in certain acts, but I think governments should sit down and think through policies, the general, the ripple effect of policies before they immediately try to enforce such policies well um there is a reason that they've given um and a lot of people have argued that that reason would never you know make a lot of sense um uh, the reason that the minister of information gave for this move um but i i want you to also speak with regards to the national assembly um you know in, in moments like this do you expect word from the national assembly is there um expected that there should have been you know uh, some input from them before this move was made 
Absolutely. You, like I said, you don't just make such blanket rules. Such rules are actually tied to laws. They are. Now, like I said, if you argue that illegal activities should be prosecuted on, so absolutely. There are things like this should be debated on. You should try and seek out public policy as well. So yes, but of course we are in Nigeria and you know we know how things happen. This, the, yes, the, the, the National Assembly, okay, you are having comments from states, other states, that is to tell you the huge implication of this. Nigeria is a signatory to international covenants and by practice, other states will have to admonish them. But the National Assembly is quiet on this. It seems that hands are tied here. People are even as surprised as we are. So at times it will take a while for people to understand the import of what is going on before reactions will begin to happen. It was quite quick, if you remember. So I think he has not even given the National Assembly time to even discuss or debate. It has happened today. The next day, the Minister of Information and Culture had uh, you know, the media um, engagement. The next thing we heard was Twitter is being banned. Well, um, uh, sadly, of course, our thoughts are with those people who would um, struggle this period because I know a lot of people have their businesses on Twitter. Um, yeah. it's, it's a full market yes. and they make sales every day, um, selling food, selling clothes, selling, you know, all, all sorts, you know, services also. Um, yeah. It has also become a useful, um, you know, crime fighting tool. Um, if you remember Absolutely. also, would, everybody will, will, will always point out to Nia Bongo Moren and say what, yeah. ha what would have happened if there wasn't Twitter when... Um, that incident happened. You know, she probably would have been dead now with no answers. Yes. Um, um, I, I, you know, also would like you to speak with regards to the OTT perspective. Um, yes. You know, there's also calls for licensing of, uh, uh, on that, um, in that regard. Uh, share, you know, what this means and how this might affect the whole conversation. Um, like I mentioned earlier about cyber balkanization, like I said, states are beginning to engage in this fragmented move, you know, less regulate. Ideally, because social media cuts across jurisdictions, it's difficult to say you want to regulate them. But of course, states can say, I want to do this. I must give a license. Now you're mandating an international company, you know, to have that sort of national presence. And in contemporary times, that is actually not the perfect move. So like I said, the states can say whatever and decide to do that. What you find that on the face of it, you know, you could be said, it could be said that we are doing this to regulate the space, to protect the space. But of course, it's a guise to also keep them away because you know that some of the companies will not begin to come to your jurisdiction to say you have to license us. Imagine if Instagram had to seek for license, you know, Facebook, all of them, everyone had to start seeking for license first, just in Nigeria. So it's, it's actually not encouraging to say the least. It's not where we are in the international scene right now in terms of discussing how to move forward for um, responsible state behavior in cyberspace. When you look at the norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace, some of these things go against the tenants, the, you know, the broad conversation as to how states should behave, even if they were seeking peace and security in the internet space. So absolutely, they can say we need to license, but in effect, it may be difficult, like I said. And so what then happens is you extricate some of these social media platforms eventually. Mm. And, um, you know, reacting to this, we know that uh, the Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC, ordered telecoms uh, operators to suspend Twitter. So out um, that the Association of Licensed Telecommunicators Operators of Nigeria said they have actually acted on this move. Well, looking, uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the fact that... Um, we know that telecom operators like, you know, the MCN and the rest, these people generate most of their revenue from, you know, uh, data subscription and Twitter, which is one of, you know, arguably one of the largest consumers of data is now seen to be, you know, off the conversation. How do you think they should be, they should be approaching this? Should they be protesting the government's move or supporting it? Well, agencies are licensed by governments. And so ideally their first obligation should be to the government. So, like I said, they are not, and that is why you have social media, um, civil society organizations are independent. It's easy for them to say, no, this can't happen. These people pay taxes to government, they are licensed by government, and they find themselves in a difficult position. Mm -hmm. I've read statements by, you know, saying, we understand that people have a right to information, but this is the situation we are in. 
So if you're a subordinate, for example, I'm just giving a, a scenario, and there's a hierarchy, you know what happens in power structures and things like that. It would have been good for people to come out and say, this won't be the case. In certain jurisdictions, it will happen. I'm imagining a thing like that, maybe in UK or other parts, they would say, you know, the broadcasting organization may say, no, this is not the case. Hmm. But yeah. we, we know how things are in different parts. Right. So. Well, I, I was just going to, you know, ask uh, uh, probably a final question. Um, how do you expect that this will play out in the next few weeks? Uh, do you think that there might uh, be a rethink from the Nigerian government side? Uh, or will, will you know, this be the start of further uh, balkanization, like you've said, and further you know, infringement on you know, these and the freedom of uh, rights to expression and all of that? Well, uh, it, my opinion has been, you know, for myself, I would really, because, I, well, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I don't know. If you ask me from a very positive side, I will expect that the government takes a, re a rethink, think about the youth, think about, you know, the joy and, you know, the fact that people express human rights on the platform. Let's think about the fact that we want to be represented well internationally. We're a civilized and democratic government. Let's think about the place of Nigeria in Africa to positively influence. So I would rather go and say that the state will, be, because saying, oh, they will go further into this is not even what I want to see. So I wouldn't want to say that. I would okay. think that the state we soft pedal, we think the policy, it is too arbitrary. Even if you think you're trying to get on a campaign of internet misinformation, let's do things appropriately. Let's think about them. Let's engage the public. Let's have adequate policies. If you want young people to engage in tech development, then fund the educational sectors. Give people access to funds. These things take time. You can't just leapfrog into those stages of development you know, that you find in other sectors. So you would have an app like Twitter just come up so that tomorrow you can also stifle them for deleting, you know, posts or for deleting um, tweets or things like that. So I would think that in the next few days, the government will do what is appropriate. You know, speak to your citizens. You owe them accountability. So when people use social media as a basis to demand good governance accountability. Let's not be seen as escalating. We should rather de-escalate. Mm. And, you know, have roundtable discussions about this and do what is correct. So I am hoping, very positive, that the state will do what is right. If they don't anyway, then I can't really say what well, will come out of it. Let's not plunge okay. into more discordance. All right, Dr. Inina Ifanya uh, Nigerian lawyer and uh, academic specializing in law and um, technology. Thank you very much for coming on The Breakfast this morning. Hopefully our next conversation will be about, you know, technological revolutions in the country. Beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. I would love to see that. Let's see digital transformation. Let's see the growth of the digital space. Let's see young people being advanced through technology. That would set Nigeria where we actually should be. Thank Indeed. you so much for having me. Indeed. Have a great day. Right. You okay. Too. Thank you. A refreshing conversation. I, I totally enjoyed it. All right. Short break. When we come back, uh, other things are coming up this morning. Uh, the Juson strike is still on. And of course, uh, their members and uh, representatives have said that governors have refused to endorse the memorandum of understanding. What does this mean and how much longer before our courts resume uh, session? We'll be talking about that after the short break. Stay with us.